Well, to the students in our classroom and those watching by DVD, welcome back. We're in session 18 in our study of spiritual gifts. This session will be about the gift of knowledge. In the previous session, we talked about the gift of faith, and we said everyone should have faith. All Christians should have faith. But those who have the spiritual gift of faith seem to have an extra measure of faith. And that comes from the Holy Spirit. And that quite often the Holy Spirit empowers them to believe that God can do even the impossible. And we encourage you that if you think you have the gift of faith, go out and try it and see how God shows up. And if it's something that you sense God is working in your life, then use it for His glory and to the benefit of the church. Well, there is a leadership conference that is held every year sponsored by my church. And it is attended by hundreds of thousands of people. How is that possible? Is there any sort of venue, any stadium that could hold that many people or more? Uh, no. So here's what they do. They videotape this, the seminar and they bring in world-class speakers, all of them who are leaders, to talk about the gift of leadership and to help those who are leaders to become more effective leaders. And by videotaping it, they can later translate it into hundreds of languages and hold it in sites in countries all around the world. But more than that, they also send it by satellite to hundreds of sites within the United States where people gather at the same time that the conference is being held in order to participate in the conference. Well, the Leadership Summit, as it is called, is a wonderful experience to learn about leadership. And I have gone and I have benefited a great deal from it. I was talking with a friend of mine who was saying, I have learned so much about leadership I love what I'm learning. I'm trying to put it into practice. I can't wait until next year. And I had this sense that it was important for me to share another view with him. It came to me spontaneously. I did not think about this. It suddenly popped into my head. And I said, well, I agree. But you know, I'm reminded of a verse that I think it's also important for us to remember. Would you turn in your Bibles along with me to the Psalms, right about in the middle of your Bible, and look at Psalm 78, which is a verse on leadership. And I suppose that's why this popped into my mind. I do have the gift of knowledge. And when I am speaking to people, and when I am speaking to you, sometimes God works in a way I don't understand to give me an idea, uh, to give me an illustration that comes out that I say, where did that come from? And it could only come from God. In this case, this person was uh, lauding the Leadership Summit, that it was tremendous, and it is. But I sensed a caution. And so I said, you know, there's a verse in Psalm chapter 78, verse 72. And it talks about David being the king of Israel. And the psalmist writes, And David shepherded them with integrity of heart. With skillful hands he led them. And I said to my friend, you know, it occurs to me that David was a wonderful leader too. And yet, in this little verse, it says, he shepherded them as their leader, first with integrity of heart. And that seems to me to mean character. And then the second one is with skillful hands, he led them. He was competent to lead them. And I said, the Leadership Summit is wonderful, but let's never forget the most important thing is our character. People follow people. And in the church, they follow people of Christian character. And then they follow people who are competent. 
They always look at the character first. Well, the gift of knowledge I have thoroughly enjoyed. It is a gift that um, has given me great blessing over the years as I've seen God uh, work through me to share a verse like that, an illustration or story that comes to me, an analogy that seems to come out of nowhere, but I know it's the Holy Spirit empowering me to give that uh, particular illustration, analogy, or verse to another person. Let's look at what the Bible actually says about it. If you would turn to the passage that we have been studying um, most often about spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, and we'll go back and we'll see where is it exactly in this passage and in what context is it used. Always important to know the context. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we'll go back to good old verse 7 and begin there. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given the Spirit of the message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. And then it goes on. So he mentions it almost early on, almost right away, the second one. And of course, as we've said before, there's no definition of knowledge. I mean, lots of people learn. Many of you watching by DVD, and most of you here who are in this classroom, you are students, not only in this classroom, but at uh, nearby universities. You're gaining knowledge, you're accumulating ideas. So how is knowledge different as a spiritual gift? Well, Paul doesn't exactly tell us. But as we've said before, we have to go back and we actually have to look at some examples from Scripture in order to understand it. So would you please turn to the book of Mark? And we will be going through several passages, so I'll ask you to please uh, turn along, follow along with this. It's always important to open your Bible and to actually look at it. There was a group of people in the early church called the Bereans. And Paul preached the gospel all over uh, the known world back then. And he preached it also to this group, the Bereans. But they did something that other groups are not commended for. They heard Paul, and they welcomed his message. They were impacted by it, but then they went home, and they checked it out for themselves in Scripture. They went and they looked and said, is Paul saying what's really in the Bible? And I think it's important for us to really open our Bibles when we hear a message and say, does that person really know what they're talking about? Very important. Well. The context for this is that there is a man who is paralyzed and four of his friends bring him to Jesus, but unfortunately there's a huge crowd around the house that Jesus is in. These men are not stopped by this obstacle, they're not deterred. They figure out the roof's made out of straw and we can remove all of the things on the roof. We could lower that person in by ropes and Jesus could heal them kind of the gift of faith right there. And then at the end of it, the man is healed. And Jesus goes one step further. He says, when Jesus saw their faith, the faith of the friends who believed their friend would be healed, and he says to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now beginning at verse 6. Now some teachers of law were sitting there thinking to themselves, thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins by, but God alone? Jesus had just said, son, your sins are forgiven. And they're going, only God can say that. And of course, only God was saying that. They just didn't know it. Going on to verse 8. This is the part about knowledge. Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, 
to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take your mat and walk. But that you may know that the Son of God has authority on earth to forgive sins, he turns to the paralytic and he says, in fearful view of everyone, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And he got up, took his mat, and walked out of them. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. Now, the gift of knowledge appears here when Jesus sensed in his spirit. That's what these guys are thinking. He didn't know what they were thinking just by natural means. The Holy Spirit working through the Son of God, because they always work in combination, allowed Jesus to know their very thoughts. See, the gift of knowledge sometimes is knowledge that is re revealed in advance. Stories, illustrations, verses, they're already there. They've been revealed. But sometimes the gift of knowledge is something that is revealed in the moment that no one else could know but the Spirit of God. It is both of those. And this is a wonderful story to show the, the gift of the Spirit of knowledge. Now, if you would turn to one more verse, please, and that is in John chapter 1. We'll take one more illustration just to make sure, since there is no definition of the gift of knowledge, uh, we need to look at Scripture to understand Scripture. John chapter 1, and then we're going to go to verse 45. So we're towards the end of the, of the chapter. And I'll give you the uh, earlier scene of what's happening. Jesus uh, is walking along the seaside. He sees Peter and uh, John working, mending their nets, and he comes to them and says, follow me. They immediately leave everything and follow Jesus. And he's walking, Jesus is walking along a little further and he sees a man named Philip and he says, follow me. Philip follows them. And then we begin at verse 45. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. He's saying, we found the Messiah. We found the promised one. He's here. We've been waiting for him and he's come. And Nathaniel says, <laughs> Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Naz Nazareth had kind of a, a shady reputation back then. And so Nathaniel's gone, yeah, right. Like the Son of God is going to come out of a place named Nazareth. We know what it's like. So Philip says, come and see for yourself. Come and see. So when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. And Nathanael has to be surprised. He says, how do you know me? And then... Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. And then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Well, Jesus, he saw Nathanael, but he didn't just see Nathanael. He was able through the Spirit to be able to sense, here is a man of godly character. And the Spirit of God revealed that to Jesus, though other people would have only have seen Nathaniel. So that, in fact, is another illustration of the gift of knowledge that was completely unknown prior to the time that the Spirit revealed it. Later in the session, we'll give some examples of those that are known. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS Seminary's database, please visit tvsseminary.com. Well, let's take a look at the Greek word for knowledge. As we look at the Greek in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 8, 
we see the word gnosis, gnosis. And it is in Strong's Concordance G1108. And the meaning is not just a general understanding of things, but a deeper, more perfect, enlarged, and advanced understanding of what's taking place. People saw Philip, but they didn't have this deeper, this enlarged, this more advanced understanding of who he was by just looking at him and the Holy Spirit revealing uh, Nathaniel's godly character. It is knowledge especially of things that belong to God, and it is comprehension of spiritual truth. It is being able to look at the Bible and understand it and pull out from it illustrations and ideas and verses that later God uses in situations where it would make sense. And the person with the gift of knowledge pulls that up at just the right moment when it's needed. Well, the definition that we are going to use for the gift of knowledge is very simple. To speak known or revealed truth. Two kinds of knowledge. That which is known, you know it in advance, and that which is revealed by the Holy Spirit. What's the uh, role of, the spiritual, of this spiritual gift? Well, it's another support gift. It doesn't stand by itself. Um, you're not going to just be the knowledge person that everybody comes to. Sometimes they do, but it's not a ministry in the church. So where does this support gift of knowledge tend to attach itself? Remember, it could attach itself to any one of the gifts, but which are the ones that it tends to attach itself with? Well, again, we see the gift of leadership. A leader would need to have knowledge and perhaps unknown knowledge to be able to lead well. It often matches up with the gift of faith so that you not only know things, but you believe that God will act upon that. But the most important gift that it matches up with is the gift of teaching. And this, in fact, is what is true in my life. I have only two gifts in my life. If there are others, they are buried deep. They may come out at some future time, but I've been a Christian for a long time, over 30 years, and I have only seen these two things work in a way that I couldn't take credit for, teaching and knowledge. And so it makes sense that a teacher would have the gift of knowledge so that they would be able to share things that helped people clarify and understand truth, which is what teachers do. Well, what is the role of uh, spiritual gift, or what's the purpose of spiritual gifts? It's to deliver God's revealed truth at the moment it's needed. And that's the key. It's not just that you know these things or they're revealed to them. It's that you share them at just the right moment when it's needed to help clarify something or needed to confront someone, or needed in order to advance someone's uh, Christian uh, spiritual development. Looking at the commentators again, I love David Gusick. He says many things that help me understand spiritual truth. And what he says about the gift of knowledge is that it's given to us supernaturally. Knowledge of things you wouldn't know through the natural acquisition or study of the Bible. Now, he's focusing on the part that's the revealed truth, not the stuff that is known. There's both sides. And then he says something that really resonated with me. When I read these words, I saw myself in these words. He says, quite often while I'm teaching, the Holy Spirit will suddenly give me an understanding of passages of Scripture that I have never really seen before. In our last session, I used an illustration that is not on this piece of paper. The thought came to me in the moment I was teaching. 
And it was the Spirit of God just planting that thought. I was talking about baseball. And it's the bottom of the, of the ninth and two outs and the team is losing and this one batter is up and they hit a grand slam. And I could see as I looked at your faces here in the classroom that that connected. You understood that God did something over and above and that the person at the plate had tremendous faith. And after our session, I stood here and said, you are really something, God. You know, I didn't even plan on saying that. You planted that idea in my mind and supernaturally, you brought it to my teaching in a way that helped people here and probably even more people who are watching this by DVD who understand the game of baseball. So I can echo what uh, is being said by David Guzik. That's the moment where I just love it because I go, yay God, wow, you are really something. And I get excited about it. Now there's another commentator, uh, set of commentators that I have not mentioned before, but they also often bring insights uh, to spiritual passages. Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown. And in their book, they talk about the gift of knowledge and they define it this way. Discovering, accumulating, analyzing, systematizing, and clarifying truth. That's a mouthful. You accumulate information, you analyze it, you then kind of put it in categories to make it clear, and then that clarifies truth. Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown say, it's the God-given gift to learn, know, and explain the precious truths of God. It's as if you have an accumulation of a fund of information about Scripture and the Christian life that's invaluable to the work of the church. What I find has been true in my life with the gift of knowledge is, as you have heard as I've shared about my life, God has given me a wealth of experiences in life. Some good, some not so good, but all of them are planted within me in this reservoir, this library, that at just the right moment, the Holy Spirit goes in and goes, all right, we'll take that one out and give it to him. See, I can't share any more than what I know. A teacher never can share more than what they themselves have experienced or what they understand, except with the gift of knowledge when it's uh, revealed. But I know that God has given me lots of verses, lots of stories, lots of illustrations, lots of diagrams that help enhance my teaching. And I love having that fund of knowledge that God gives me. We have talked about having a visual aid. The one I want you to think of here is a newspaper. Because just as a newspaper is a wealth of information about worldly things, the Holy Spirit empowers people to go into the library with the gift of knowledge and give us wealth of spiritual information. The newspaper is where we gain knowledge of the world. In a sense, there's a spiritual newspaper planted within those with the gift of knowledge that God pulls out truth that is spiritual information people need. Would you turn one last time to Matthew chapter 16? Matthew chapter 16. You know, the thing I love about Peter is that he's so human. Peter, like, makes mistakes all the time. He's always doing something wrong, you know? And right when he does something right, it's like the next moment he does something wrong. And I just go, man, Peter's so much like me. I like this guy. I like the fact that yeah, he's a regular guy. I mean, he's just going along, doing his best, and the next moment, he's tripping over his own feet. Or he's <laughs> tripping over his own mouth, as you'll see here. When Jesus 
I'm looking at verse 13 of Matthew 16, and I need to give the context. Right before this had been uh, the uh, uh, feeding of the 5,000, and Peter had seen that, and he had heard about that. The prophets had been, uh, Jesus had shared about the prophets. He had talked about beware of yeast. And for three years, he's been with these 12 guys walking around Israel, Galilee, Judea, and now comes the moment of truth. Jesus says, who do people say I am? And they replied, well, some say you're John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And they're thinking it's those people who either have come back to life or that their spirit has somehow come within this person, Jesus of Nazareth. They still don't get it. They still don't understand. And now comes the critical moment in his whole three-year ministry with these 12. But what about you? Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. It was revealed truth. It was like at that moment, the Spirit empowered Peter and said, Peter, come on, you know who this guy is. He's the Messiah, the Son of God. And this is his great confession. And it's from that moment on that Jesus turns his face and heads towards Jerusalem and certain death. But he must have been thrilled that at that moment, after investing three years of his life, they finally got it. And Peter was the one, through the gift of knowledge, that got it. Once I was talking with a friend, uh, and my friend was telling me all kinds of problems in his life. He didn't feel like his walk with Christ was going well. There were problems in his marriage. His job wasn't working well. It was lots of, oh, woe is me. And so as I listened and I waited till he was done, I said, well, how about your spiritual life? I mean, are you reading the Bible? And he said, yeah, I'm reading the Bible. I said, well, are you praying? Yeah, yeah, I've been praying. You know, maybe not as much as I should, but I'm praying. Are you going to church and worshiping God, being with other Christians and fellowshiping? Absolutely. You know, I go to church every Sunday. And in a flash, it came to me. It wasn't any of those things. And this illustration came. I said, you know, when I was a boy, on Christmas morning one time, my mother and father gave all three of their sons an uh, electric train set. Every boy wants an electric train set that they can play around with and crash and see how fast they can get it going. Well, we set it all up. We were all excited. And we turned it on. It didn't go. And so my dad is like, okay, check the power. It's plugged in. Yeah, all of these are together. It should be working. And then finally, I noticed that there was a piece of tinsel on the track. And that was short wiring the whole system. It was cutting out the power. And I said, that piece of tinsel is sin. Is there sin in your life? Well, there was sin in his life, big time sin in his life. And it was in that moment that I wasn't thinking about telling him uh, this story, but God gave it to me. I have some questions to ask you, as I will in each of these sessions. And I'd like you to think about this in terms of your own walk with Christ. Have you seen God do these things? Or are they things you can envision God doing in your life? And if so, you may very well have the gift of knowledge. 
Has God worked through you to, one, possess a wide set of stories, illustrations, and verses that somehow stay in your brain? Two, has God worked through you to have your Bible knowledge and your experiences unexpectedly come to mind? And finally, three, has God worked through you to sense the exact moment that you should share that information with someone so that it clarifies the situation? If you've answered yes to any of those questions, you may possibly have the gift of knowledge. But once again, as we've said, go try it on for size like you would a suit of clothes. And if you have it, celebrate it, because I can tell you, it is a great gift. And we'll continue on with our session. The next one will be on wisdom. Come on back and join us.